Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode 80. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me is no one else. We're going to be trying a little bit of an experiment today. I'm going to be talking about solo games, and so I figured it would is more than appropriate for it to be only me. I don't know how it's going to work. This is, again, sort of an experiment. I'm also going to be, I think, lowering down the editing a bit. I think it's appropriate when talking about solo games that we allow a little bit more silence. I don't know how much you all know about podcast editing, but I do take away a lot of the breaks between sentences when I'm editing, not only verbal pauses like ums and uhs, or large breaths, or when someone you know types on their keyboard or distractions like that, but I also often take away any, any pause between words or sentences that is more than just a fraction of a second. And I started doing that, I suppose, just because it sounded right. And I don't know why that is, because the podcast is conversational. It's designed around the idea that we're just talking about games after we've played the games. That was the initial conceit of the podcast. Of course, I do other things as well. I do a lot of interviews that we'll see uh, up, upcoming and you've seen in the past. But this idea that conversational speed of speaking is too slow for this kind of media is is interesting to me. And it's not like I read something online that's like, oh, you got to take away the pauses in between words and sentences. But I think that's what we're used to is a kind of slightly sped up rapid pace compared to when we're just talking with people. And I don't know, I I, I suppose part of that is that you can't see us. So when you're in a normal conversation, you can see the facial expressions of the person you're conversing with, and that can kind of add information and fill in information that that keeps those pauses active, I suppose. And if it's just a podcast, it's only a pause. Although I feel like a pause in and of itself conveys some kind of meaning I and mean, obviously we've seen a game about that with uh i've completely forgotten the name of that game uh not the game the other was a sequel to the game i forget the mind that's what it's called uh, which is all about pauses all about the meaning behind not doing something but i i cut him out and and it just sounds more natural to me and i i have this feeling that that has been trained into me with the internet, with like early vlog aesthetics, where you notice the the jump cuts frequently. Thinking back, I always assume that that's because those people were very poor speakers and they're cutting out all their stumbles and and words that they didn't use correctly and verbal pauses and uh, stuff like that. But I think they were just cutting out the small pauses between words and sentences and the jump cuts were like between different takes. They're all within the same take or mostly the same take. And that was just to get the information out more quickly. But we're talking about solo games and I'm not a big solo gamer, but one thing I do appreciate about solo games is the pace of it. Even when you're doing a lot, it feels slow and that's been kind of nice. I don't know why it's taking me this long given the pandemic, to start playing my solo games that I collected at the beginning of the pandemic. Now, I haven't quite figured that one out, but I have. I finally got into them. Maybe I've seen the hope on the horizon, and I know that I'll be able to play in person much more in the near future. And I'm like, oh, I have these solo games. I might as well get to them. If I'm not going to get to them now, I probably won't get to them. And then I played them, but I I planned on playing these over a year ago, and and I I haven't. Not sure why. But I guess the solo gaming experience for me isn't necessarily about silence, because I notice I'm a mutterer. I mutter everything during my solo games. And if you just heard a recording of my voice playing a solo game, it would sound like the ramblings of a crazy person. And I think what I'm looking a lot forward to, I'm not going to say the most forward to, but I'm looking forward to a lot when I get to play in person more is 
the strategy games where there is that silence, that shared silence around the table, and it's fundament fundamentally different between the silence in a solo game and the silence in a competitive game where everyone is thinking at once. And that latter silence is something that I think I'm missing a lot in my game playing that I haven't experienced in a while. I mean, I've, I've, there are some friends, some close friends that we've played games with throughout the pandemic during the, the, the less scary times. Uh, we've kind of bubbled ourselves as a little game bubble. Uh, but we haven't played a lot, and we're doing a lot of online games and such. And I just can't wait to, like, sit down and play a big, heavy game where there's lots of not talking, there's lots of intense thinking, playing a Lacerda game or an 18xx game or something in person again. And, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. But let's switch over to solo games. So I've got three solo games that I want to talk about. Actually, there's a fourth. Let me get the fourth out of the way. It's not really a solo game. For some reason, I thought it was designed primarily as a solo game, but it doesn't seem to be, although it does have a solo mode. And that is Arial, I believe. I, it's French. I don't know how to pronounce it. A-R-R-A-I-A-L. I'm assuming it's something like that, but with a Frenchy accent. And, man, it's it's Tetris in a game. And you say that a lot about a lot of games. You got all those Uwe games where he's using the polyomino uh, pieces. But this one is really more or less straight-up Tetris. The pieces fall down. They have to fit at the top. You can slide them over once they reach the bottom. It's very much trying to emulate Tetris. And I don't think it's a particularly good solo game. I beat the highest score threshold on my first try. Seemed relatively simple. I think when there's competition over the pieces and people are, are messing with your plans, you have to adapt. I think that'll be the better game. But I wanted to throw that out there because I did play it solo over the last couple of weeks. But I'm talking about three games that I believe were designed for the solo player, player. I mean, two of them specifically are. You, there's not really a rule set for more than one player. The third one there is, but it seems like a solo game, and I think most people enjoy it solo or maybe with two players. So let's talk about that first one, or that last one first, and that's the Arkham Horror LCG. And I don't think I've made it a secret that I do not like the Arkham games from Fantasy Flight. I have played the original Arkham Horror years ago. I mean, back in college, so like uh, 12, 13 years ago, maybe. I don't remember it that much other than it took forever and I didn't know what was happening. And uh, we lost quite early on. And they're like, well, we lost. I'm like, oh, cool. That took three hours. Um... And, uh, yeah, that set a bad tone. I haven't played it again. I played Eldritor twice or three times, perhaps. Uh, everyone, every time someone promising me that it's going to be a much better experience than Arkham Horror. And, yeah, I suppose it is, but I, I don't understand that game. I don't understand the enthusiasm for it. I mean, partially it's suppose I don't really care about Lovecraftian horror. Although, I do understand the idea of it. The idea of, like, monstrous, beyond our imagination, beyond our comprehension horror. Cosmic horror, I believe it's called. That makes sense to me. The games are not about that. They're about monsters you can see. And they're about things that are very tangible. And they're about luck. In luck in a really annoying way, where I feel like I don't really have any agency. Like, last time I played Eldritor, and my, my memory's fuzzy. This, this was a few years ago. I'm pretty sure for over half the game, I parked at one location and just tried to do the same thing over and over, because it seemed like the only thing my character was good at, and failed a lot which made the future rolls more tough, and I just sat there every turn. It's like, okay, well, I'll try the same thing again. And, uh, look, I fail, and I go crazy in this specific way, and, well, there's nothing better to do. The odds are only going to get worse if I try something else, so I'll just stay here. That's not a fun game. I don't, I don't understand the appeal of it, and I don't understand the theming of it, because if it's supposed to be Lovecraftian cosmic horror, 
it's far too tangible and like st- not straightforward. It's far too right there. The whole point of Cosmic Horror is that it's supposed to be not there. It's supposed to be around you, perhaps, or in places, uh, you know, in the Earth. I don't. I haven't read a lot of Lovecraft. But the point is that it's not supposed to be the monster standing right in front of you, right? It's not supposed to be uh, like the famous SNL sketch Land Shark, uh, where you open the door, oh, it's a shark. It's standing there, and it tries to eat you. That, I mean, that's funny, but... There's a reason in Jaws you don't see the shark for a very long time, like in the original movie that they're making fun of, and that is that not seeing the shark is scarier than seeing the shark. You see what the shark does, and when it's this kind of animal horror, which I think is what Cosmic Horror is kind of getting at, uh, it, it, it's it's animal in the sense that you don't fully understand its motives. Like, you can understand that an animal operates in a rational way generally in terms of like wanting to eat and wanting to survive and wanting to you know feel good but you don't quite understand on a moment to moment basis what an animal is going to do you know if they've got food in front of them but there's also a, a sense of danger right if you're trying to like feed a squirrel and you, the food's real close to you, and so you can see the squirrel kind of go back and forth between, well, I want this food, but I don't want to approach this person. That kind of, like, second-to-second decision-making is, is unpredictable. There's obviously predictability in the animal wanting food, but that doesn't make the actions of the animal less predictable. Um, or more predictable, rather. And in the same way, I think if your if your horror villain is some kind of eldritch god, like maybe you have some understanding that the god wants to exert power. I don't know, but on a moment by moment basis, you have no idea if it thinks of you, what it thinks of you, how much it cares or does not care about you, and that's where the horror comes from—the unknown. In the board game. Right, yeah, you know that one of the gods is going to pop up because that's the conceit of the game. And you know you got to do these things to prevent it from popping up slash help you in the fight when it does pop up and then it appears and it's right there in front of you and then you fight it. That's literally the opposite experience as what it's trying to do. And this is where you have this disconnect between setting and theme that I think more people are talking about now, and rightly so, that Eldritch Horror isn't really a horror game. It's a it's a it's a it's a dice based cooperative game along the lines of pandemic or something. It it has no connection to its source material on a mechanical thematic level. And that's partially what frustrates me. The other part is that I don't feel like I really have any agency in the game. That stuff just happens to me. And it's like, well, that happened to me. And I don't feel like my choices played into that very much, which is just a death knell for for any kind of game. Anyways, I played Arkham Horror. I played Eldritch Horror. I played, they're more, I cannot remember the the name of it. I'm going to look it up as I'm talking here. But it was a more uh, intimate one. It was like set in a, was it a town? I can't remember. And you hear my keyboard as I type. Fantasy Flight. I cannot remember. It went really under the radar. What was it called? It was definitely one of the Fantasy Flight games. All right. I'm going to click on products for Fantasy. Oh, no. It's rather organized. Okay. Arkham Horror. Which one is it? Is it Buried? Oh, Final Hour. Here we go. Arkham Horror, Final Hour, that was my favorite of them, just because it it managed to be short and tidy and quick, and it's like, okay, it's a perfectly fine cooperative game, and it kind of just condenses everything, so at least, like, it doesn't stretch out and try to be epic, it's more this, like, more action movie kind of thing, where, oh, there's all these zombies coming out, or, you know, whatever the creatures are, I don't think they were actually zombies, but you gotta try to 
stop them and do something and lock the gates. I don't remember what the thing was. But the point is that it was more that action aesthetic, and that fits a bit better in the in a cooperative game where you're trying to, like, run around and not get hit and attack monsters and accomplish intermediary goals to try to get to your ultimate goal at the end. Uh, it was fine. I still think it's hideously ugly. I hate the art. I'm sorry whoever did the art for these games or who... The, I assume multiple people who do the art for these games. They're drab and dark and have no character and uh, muddy and look bad on the table. And every time I play an Arkham game, I hate the art even more. Sorry. All right, now we get to the fourth one I played, which is what I'm actually going to be talking about, and that's the Arkham LCG, the card game. And I got this because everyone loves it. Everyone loves this game. I hear people talking about all the time all the netrunner people uh when netrunner closed down seemed to immediately switch to arkham and they they loved it and i maybe see why you would love it once you've invested like 100 200 bucks in it but the core set by itself is abysmal it is barely a game it's like this this concept of a minimum viable product in in tech development where you present like the most minimum product you can that accomplishes what you kind of want to do and then just see how it does and i don't want to see that becoming a thing in board games now i don't know how fantasy flight did with its other lcgs in terms of the core set other than netrunner and i think netrunner was close to the line for me but in Netrunner, you could do some decent deck building. It's hard looking back once you've gotten all the cards and you see how garbage some of the cards in the core set are. And you're like, wow, I would never play with that card. But if you don't have a chance, you got to play with it. And but, but both sides are in that predicament. And you end up getting some decent games and you get to explore all the different factions decently and have a little bit of deck building built in there into the core set. So I think that's playable as a game. Like if you only bought the core set of Netrunner... And I don't remember, I believe the second edition core set was improved in terms of like balance and such. But if you only bought the core set, either one, for Netrunner, and you wanted to stop there, you'd have a good game. You'd have a fun game, and you could do a lot of, have a lot of fun within deck build and play around and test things. Arkham Horror LCG, first of all, you get one like three act campaign. So each one took maybe. 60 to 90 minutes, so you got about four hours of game in the box before you've, like, completed the campaign. And I didn't really see any room to deck build at all. Like, even when I got upgrades, like, you get these upgrade points so you can upgrade your deck, I, I had a hard time finding a card that seemed like an actual upgrade. Like, I did, but I'm like, okay, this is very marginally an upgrade. But in terms of, like, crafting a deck that actually does something other than a deck that's just a pile of the best cards you can find, I didn't see any room for that in the Arkham LCG. No room for it at all. I just built the decks that they recommended in the rules, and there's hardly any cards left over after that. And of the cards that are left over, they're just often just variations on the same idea of getting resources uh, in, in various different ways, but the power level is about the same. I don't know. Someone could correct me. I don't really want to play this game anymore. I played through the three-act campaign. The first two acts I did uh, with a friend. The other one I did solo. Honestly, it was a little bit better solo just because it was quicker, and I can see why people play it solo. In terms of the storytelling, yeah, they did some clever stuff there with how the story plays out and how the new threats emerge. But man, it takes forever to get things set up. The setup for this game is almost as long as the game itself. Like, we're talking like 20, 30 minutes just to get myself to the point where I could start playing the game. At the beginning, I tried to play the, the time I played this a couple weeks ago was my third or fourth attempt to play the game because I would get bogged down in the setup. In trying to sort these cards. And it's so annoying to sort these cards. So annoying. Some of them only have the identifying information on one side of the card. But they're double-sided cards. 
So I spent 15 minutes mid-game thinking that I wasn't given a particular card, and I was at the point where I was looking up an image of the card just to put it on my phone and play with that in front of me because, you know, I wasn't going to try to contact them for one card of a game I already wasn't liking. But I thought, man, I I wasn't even given this card. It was just a manufacturing error. And uh, no, it was a double-sided card, but the only information... The identifying information that I would find the card with was only on one side, and it happened to be on the other side. There's another thing where you gotta you want to s- group the cards into these different sets, but based on the type of card, the set symbol is in a different location on the card, which is just bad design. It's just bad graphic design. You want to be able to flip through the cards quickly and make sure that you have them sorted in the, into the correct sets. It's also like there's so many different identifiers on the cards of like what they are that I really didn't grasp. It was just so annoying to get to the point where I was playing the game. And I I, I don't know if I could get past that. Like you got to have a better system for that. You have to have a better system. Even if the game, like, even if I did want to invest like 200 bucks to get the game to a point where I could build decks and I could feel like I'm really playing the game as it's supposed to be, man, just getting all the cards <laughs> set up and then finding the right sets of cards for each little submission and making sure they're organized in the correct way with certain individual cards being placed outside of the deck, other cards being shuffled in, cards from other sets being shuffled in. So there's one point in the, I guess this is the most minor of spoilers, but there's one point in the in the base game campaign where if you don't defeat a particular monster, it goes back in the future decks. So it keeps, it keeps stalking you. And it's got a lot of cool thematic touches like that. Just the road to getting there is, is annoying. And it's part of a particular set of cards. So I, when I was done with one of the cam, one section of the campaign, I reorganized the cards back into their sets. And then the next day, when I went to start the next segment of the campaign, it said, "Put this particular card and and called it by name. Uh, if you didn't kill it, back into the pile." At that point, the card was just one of many in a given set symbol, but it didn't even tell me what the set symbol was. So I had to try to remember, and I ended up just flipping through like a hundred cards to find the one named card that I needed because it didn't even bother telling me what set it was in. Little stuff like that drove me insane. And I guess that's the most thematic part of the game is the setup. Like if you want to be driven insane by tiny annoying things which is actually you know part of this this love crafting setting yeah i mean it captures that decently so i guess i should give it points for that anyways maybe it gets good but i i I am upset at the level or lack of level of content in the base box and i'm not going to give them any more of my money to get more just not going to i got it super on sale for like 18 bucks so at that point, yeah, it was worth it just to try it out, but you've got to, I, 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 I poked around on Twitter on the, and on the internet and asked around, and people said, well, if you get one complete cycle, which is a, a big expansion and then six, uh, six packs, basically, uh, that's like, you'll have a really good sense of what the game is, but that's like over a hundred bucks for a full cycle. And there's not a lot of deals going around, not a lot of sales. So you're looking at over 100 bucks just to get to the point in a card game where you feel like you're playing a real game and not this, like, demo. I, I don't buy it. Uh, so far, so if you wanted to know, Final Hour so far is my favorite Arkham game. The one that no one has heard of. <laughs> and no one really cares about. Uh, I don't know. Anyways, let's move on to another game that is also about survival in horrific situations, and that is the game Unbroken. And if you've heard of this game, you've probably heard it because of its Kickstarter publishing fiasco, where the designer, who by all accounts is a great guy, and I looked up interviews and such, and he seems like an upstanding, 
great guy, wants to do the right thing, wants to design games, gets absolutely hosed by an organization called Golden Bell Studios. I'm going to double check the name of that because I'm going to get real mean at them. I think it's Golden Bell. Google auto-corrected it to Golden Belly, uh, which I believe was a Chinese restaurant. I don't know why. Is that a nearby Chinese restaurant? Oh, Golden Bell is an award. Uh, Golden Bell Games. Let's do that. Golden Bell Studios. Yeah, this is it. This is them. Let me make sure. Villains of the board game world. Do they have this game listed somewhere? Man, they've published so many games I've never heard of. Probably because they never got made. Really? Okay, I'm just going to go to the Unbroken page. It is, yep, Golden Bell Games. So there's two publishers listed, Ultima Games, Ultima, I don't know, and Golden Bell. Ultima, I believe, is the publishing studio of the designer. And Golden Bell are the villains. And from what I understand, Golden Bell's business strategy is to find Kickstarters that aren't doing well, haven't yet met their goal, and being like, hey, we've done dozens of Kickstarters here sign this contract and we'll try to get your Kickstarter over the hump and and, and published and funded or we'll redo the campaign anyways and then the contract they give the people is just awful not only is it awful but then they don't even meet the contract and with unbroken basically they couldn't scale from what I understand or they just messed up the numbers at the beginning where the game was given what they had promised in terms of production. The game was far too cheap and they didn't calculate shipping correctly. Which, I mean, is why you would bring in an established publisher to like know that information in the first place. Anyways, and then uh, when they got, it became a big old Kickstarter hit and got way overfunded. They weren't able to actually pay for the production of the game. They sent out a bunch of emails asking people to pay more for shipping or to, like, donate money. Uh, And when they got hit bit with any kind of resistance, and, you know, I'm sure there was some resistance that was wholly unnecessary and rude, uh, but they doubled down, apparently, and got even more rude and bad, and uh, everyone hates them. That's the short of it. You can look up the the, the gritty details online, I'm sure. Uh, but the, the the short story is that Golden Bell Games is as close to fraudulent, I think, as you can get without maybe being fraudulent. I, I'm sure they've been sued a couple of times. I'm sure there are ongoing lawsuits. Uh, but they're, they're scummy uh, people, it seems, based on everything I've heard. Anyways, I didn't get in on this Kickstarter. I was able actually given this game from another reviewer because uh, they didn't want to review it, I think, or they had already reviewed it. I can't remember. Anyways, I got my hands on it because it did sound interesting, but I wanted to give that uh, preface of, you know, the, the the publisher that got brought on royally screwed up and then doubled down on being awful. But let's look at the game. The game itself is a cooperative game about surviving. It's got this big old long story mythos at the beginning of the rule book that I skimmed and it's like I don't know there's some kind of magic but everyone's been driven underground and the 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 surface of the earth is filled with hideous monsters once I realized that I kind of gotten the gist of what was going on I stopped reading maybe there's some interesting details later on there sure is a lot of flavor text in this rule book and I thought this was going to be a really complex game because the rule book's thick like, it's a booklet size, but, man, it's like 30, 40 pages. Turns out the last, like, quarter or third of the rule book is just advertisements for other Golden Bell games, which, I mean, figures. And then, like, the first four pages are all the flavor text and such, which, yeah, if you want to build a, a, a setting, maybe build more games around it, maybe that becomes interesting. But the game itself is actually quite light. It's a basic push-your-luck kind of thing. And I enjoyed it, actually. I enjoyed it uh, a decent amount. I think it needs, like, one more layer of complexity to work. And it's got these really nice components inlaid, 
player boards where you keep track of all your resources. And basically what you're doing is going through three acts, I believe, with three major monsters. And you go out and gather resources and such and go on little quests, uh, which, which have you choose between two options, basically. And uh, then, or rather you, the adventure deck, you like pick two cards, you choose one. And then you can either take the exchange. It's usually an exchange of one resource for more of another resource uh, with a with a very short description thematically of what's going on. Or you can you can sacrifice the time for more just basic action points, which are this this like effort resource, which is actually subdivided into three different types of effort, and you have to like turn in the lower effort to upgrade into higher effort, which is required for certain things. Uh, so that's this like little adventure thing going on. You do that. You could do some other things to try to get the balance of resources you want for the next fight. The main goal is to upgrade your weapon. There's like a little tiny tech tree for the weapons so that you, you can upgrade from bare fist into, was it a knife and then a spear? And then based on what you choose there, you get one more choice of one more little tree branch between two options. Uh, so I think there are like four ultimate endgame weapons that you're trying to get to. But the problem is once you have upgraded your weapon and managed to survive, there's not really much more to do. You just want to like gather resources, uh, which ends up being a bit dull because I got my, my, my final weapon like right at the end of the second act. And then the third act, I'm like, is, isn't there more to do to like fundamentally upgrade other than just trying to maximize the resources I need? And there wasn't. So that was a bit of a downer. It's one of those games where I think if you, I think the second act is the most important. Uh, so the first one, you're just trying to build up something and get in position and survive. The second act is really where all the action happens. And if you did well, the third act is going to be a breeze. And if you didn't do well, you'll die. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's that kind of game. There's lots of dice rolling, some mitigation on that. I just wish there was something beyond upgrading the weapon as an intermediary goal to, to shoot for, to add just another layer of choices, and there wasn't. But fortunately, it's a quick game. Uh, it's listed as 15 to 30 minutes. I think that's about correct. And Unbroken, I think, is, is good. I'm going to keep it around. I'm going to play around with it. Might not stay in my collection for long, but I, I think it's pretty good. Finally, the third solo game I wanted to talk about that I finished my second playthrough of yesterday after playing the night before and loving it, is Nemo's War 2nd Edition, which uh, was highly lauded uh, not only as a great solo game and a really like big package and expensive package for a solo game, which is rare, but also it's art and production by Ian O'Toole, who is one of our best board game graphic designers and artists. I think it does look nice, although I think, like, I'm not that old. I'm, I'm 31 years old. And I had a hard time see, like reading the text on the other side of the board. <laughs> it's like uh, serif, like small thin serif font on many of the places on the board. And man, if you had worse size than me, you would have such an annoying time reading some stuff in this game. So I think the graphic design looks nice. I don't know. I, I wish it was slightly more functional. Uh, but Nemo's War really got me lost in it. So like with Arkham, I was a lot of anger going on, frustration at the game, unbroken. I never got immersed in the game. It was like, okay, here's the mechanics. Yeah, these work, these function. I wish there was a bit more, but I'm always thinking about the games in terms of the mechanics. Uh, Nemo's War I got lost in, in terms of like thinking actually about strategy and actually about the kinds of encounters I was coming across in my adventures based on uh, the uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea novel. Or stories? Is that a group of stories or is that a novel? I can't remember. I read part of it way back in the day and have no memory of it. Anyways, that's the setting for Nemo's War. And man, it's it's aptly named. It's certainly a war uh, because you're going to be fighting so many ships. And I started with, and this is one of the coolest parts of the game that I wish more games would do, is that you have a choice between four different motivations for Nemo. And that's going to determine how different things score, how different items score. So I started 
with the recommended one in the first game, which was exploration. And I thought, great, I'm going to get to like explore around. I, uh, my ship is a submarine, so I can like skip all the fights and just try to find cool things and grab treasure and be awesome. But even with that like low combat motivation, man, I had to do a lot of combat, <laughs> like a lot of combat, just because that's how the game works. And that's kind of the timer against you in the game is that you are gaming in, gaining infamy and every turn ships are coming into the oceans that you're traversing about. And if the, the oceans get overwhelmed with these enemy ships, you lose. That's one of the last conditions. So you have to be, you have to start fighting ships to some degree. Uh, the game I played yesterday, I picked the most aggressive one. His motivation was war with an exclamation point. And I just started fighting ships left and right. Uh, my infamy almost got too high and I almost hit that loss condition. But that was fun, just blasting ships left and right and trying to get upgrades. And there's just a lot more going on in Nemo's War. Uh, the rulebook is not very good. I had a lot of struggles with the rulebook and some really awkward phrasing. I've heard that maybe they're doing a new version of the rulebook at some point. But once you figure out the flow of the game, it, it, it sticks with you. So once you get past the rulebook, it's not one of those games where you're going to have to look in the rulebook necessarily a lot. There's some little fiddly stuff, especially with combat, but fortunately there's also a ton of reference guides on the board, the game board itself. So I ended up looking at those mostly because they were a lot more succinct and a lot more straightforward than the rulebook. So what you're doing in the game is the cycle of the game is that you're first drawing an adventure card, which is... I would say equal amounts, positive or negative. A lot of them are tests where you have to roll a certain number with modifiers uh, to try to pass the test. And if you do, it's good. If you don't, it's bad. Some of them are just bad. Some of them are just good. Uh, but different adventures you're going on. Then you roll two dice. And it's a re interesting mechanism. I think it works. You roll two dice and you place new ships in the ocean locations that are indicated as the dice roll. So there's six oceans on the board and then a few sub-oceans or like channels. I forget what they're called in the game. Uh, but, this, you know, smaller locations in between the major oceans. And so if you roll like a two and a six, uh, you place a ship in the two ocean, which is like the Pacific, North Pacific maybe. I don't remember. And then you place one in the six ocean, which is, I believe, the Indian Ocean. And then... The difference between the, the two dice is how many action points you get. Which, in the first stage of the game, is a bit chaotic. Because, man, a couple times you roll, like, two adjacent numbers, you only get one action point for the turn. It feels real bad. Uh, but as you progress in the game, you start rolling more dice. So the first thing that happens is you grab a black die. And, oh, wait, no. Do you grab a black die? I, I cannot remember. That might be the first upgrade. And then that just accelerates the rate at which ships get put out. Uh, but finally, in the, in the last phase of the game, or the second to last phase of the game, uh, you add a third white die, and then you get to choose which two of the white dice are giving you your action points, which gives you more flexibility. Because also, if you roll doubles, you get to do this like lull phase, which is, has slightly different rules than you want to do a few times during the game. Uh, and the main things you're going to be doing are fighting ships. You're going to be searching for treasure. So treasure appears periodically in the different areas of the board. You always want to try to gobble those up uh, because they're points, but also they give you on occasion really valuable stuff like extra action points or uh, free rerolls if you roll poorly in a situation um, that you can exchange the treasure's point value for those things. You want to be... Uh, starting uprisings in the different colonies in those areas, which will give you points at the end of the game. Um, and then you also just want to be upgrading your ship and finding cool stuff. Uh, so the upgrade system is interesting. When you defeat an enemy ship, you can, you can scrap it for basically parts and money to upgrade your own ship. Or you can put the ship in as tonnage, which is purely points. So you have a choice between, again, points and upgrading. It's got those classic dilemmas, right, all over the place. Push your luck, 
choices between points, between uh, things that are going to make you stronger in the later game and things that are going to give you points now. Uh, but it's wrapped in this nice package with, with lots of cool adventure cards and lots of really fun thematic stuff that's happening. Like, it's hard to have a game where, like, your adventure or event deck is both potentially surprising where you'd actually be legitimately surprised at something that is happening to you without it being too chaotic that's a that's a fine line to walk and too many games i think err on the side of having those events be too balanced to where they just become boring they just become kind of this different flavors of the same ice cream that doesn't that that phrase makes no sense at all I guess different flavors of ice cream because all, yeah, anyways, you know what I mean. They end up being just kind of, yeah, the same thing over and over with different ways of getting there or just different types of resources. In Nemo's War, yeah, there's some really strong stuff. There's this cannonball upgrade that's really clutch if you get it early. I got, in my last game, I got this one that gives me a plus two to all uprising rolls, which is significant. Uh, and made me max out my uprising, which is precisely what my character wanted, um, what my vote, my my Nemo's motivation wanted. And if I got those things later in the game, it wouldn't be as good. But uh, I don't know. I, I think it, it hit that nice balance between chaos and between compelling story stuff that is potentially surprising. Uh, it hit it very nicely. You're going to be using maybe a third of the event deck in each game, so maybe you'll see some duplicates a lot after a handful of games. Uh, but I don't think that'll be too bad, because they are interesting. And it's got different finales, which are nice uh, for your, the last card that you draw that determines whether you win or lose, if you haven't lost already. So far, I've gotten the second highest level of victory. So there's like five different... If you don't lose to one of the auto-lose conditions, there are like five levels of victory and non-victory you can get. And so far, I've just been a couple points under the highest level. Uh, but I want to try out all the motivations. That's where it really changes and affects things. And I, I, before I up the difficulty level. Difficulty seems good for fun at the moment. doesn't seem too insanely challenging uh, but it, it is a game that could snowball so you have some really bad things happen at the beginning it could snowball out pretty hard and, and make the game tough so far I've managed to be able to avoid that part of that is that you have these crew members you can sacrifice which is really grim and, and a lot of the game was actually quite dark if you really look into it you can sacrifice crew members for really clutch uh, situations clutch plays uh, which I've able to mitigate most of the worst things that have happened. But Nemo's War really has gotten its teeth into me. I want to play it again. I, I didn't even fully put away the game yet because I might play another one tonight. Uh, but yeah, if, you, if you're into solo games, and maybe if you're not, because I'm not really into solo games, uh, Nemo's War might be one to check out. It's, it's really fun, at least for a handful of plays. Maybe you get burnt out of it after a while. You, you start seeing... The edges, you start seeing the game in terms of these like really simple decision points uh, instead of seeing the theme and instead of seeing the game as it wants to be seen. And at that point, maybe you get done with the game, but I think there's a lot of complexity there. There's a lot of, there's a lot of interesting decision making in how the ships come out because while the locations of where the ships come out is random. Once the board fills up with hidden ships, you start revealing ships, and then in, you can reveal ships in the ocean that was rolled or one of the side oceans. And I think that planning out where the revealed ships go could be a big part of like advanced strategy with this game. But anyways, those are the three slash, we'll say three and a half solo games that I've been playing. I hope you all enjoyed this podcast and I hope you all enjoy games in the future because it seems like we're pulling out of this pandemic. I don't know necessarily where what it's looking like where you are listening, but here in the US, in New England, we're getting to the point a lot of people are getting vaccinated. I'm hoping to get my vaccination in a couple of days. 
or my first shot of the vaccination. And it's corresponding with the emergence of spring, which has a nice poetic quality to it. And I, more than maybe other years, I kind of feel the spring. I feel that as the flowers and trees and grass are growing and blooming and, and coming out of the earth, uh, people are doing the same thing and it's going to be weird for a while. It's going to be very strange. And I think perhaps we've, on a, on a psychological level, we're becoming so accustomed to a level of isolation we, we weren't used to before that emerging and getting back to social life is going to be very weird and awkward. Now, I think games can help that along a lot. And I think games... One of the benefits of board games, and I, I've spoken about this before, is that part of any nerd community is that you can assume that many of the people in that community are going to be socially awkward. And for those who are somewhat socially awkward, like myself, that's a comfort uh, to a point. Obviously, you get to a point where it, you know some people are just behaving poorly and not just socially awkwardly or, or feeling slightly uncomfortable. But I think games can be a kind of way to integrate ourselves back into social life nicely. And for that, I'm thankful. Thanks for watching, everybody. Again, as I've said many times on this podcast, man, we're at episode 80. Don't forget to rate and review it. Uh, hit me up on social media. And if you want to support it, go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer. I really do appreciate any kind of support you can give uh, monetarily a message a rating on a on a uh, podcast venue um, anything like that helps out and helps keep this going of course I'm also do all kinds of written things at the thoughtful and I, th I think that I got no one here to, to remind me of what I missed in my outro so I'm just gonna leave it there thanks for listening everybody goodbye